This video is brought to you by War Thunder. The city of Wilmington, North Carolina, once hosted what was perhaps America's most impressive flotilla, an assortment of many, many World War II ships, kept as a reserve on paper, but as a rusting pile of nearly abandoned ships in reality. This reserve group comprised an almost dizzying 700 ships, and yet today, they've all but disappeared, leading the public to wonder what happened to this reserve force, and what were the stories of these ships. Stay tuned to find out, as today we discover the history of the lost Wilmington Reserve Fleet. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Much like the rest of the United States in the early 20th century, Wilmington was a comparably small town in an almost rural state. The city's growth came later than many other cities, even within the southern states, but in the 1920s, the rural town was turning into a burgeoning center of textiles, tobacco, and carpentry industries. This small boom was almost destroyed by the Great Depression, and the city likely would have taken years to recover without community agencies, such as the Wilmington Relief Association, who made it their mission to provide outreach and support in the years of small government and neglect that predated FDR and the New Deal. With that considered, Wilmington was in a tough position when the Second World War began in 1939, but things were about to rapidly change. North and South Carolina saw an immense military buildup during the war. In total, Camp Davis, Lejeune and the Bluthenthal Army Air Base were all built or well underway by 1941. However, the crown jewel of North Carolina's efforts was the Wilmington Shipyard. As part of the Navy's demands for more cargo shipping, the famous Virginia company, Newport News Shipbuilders, established the Wilmington Yards as a satellite firm with Newport News Company executives establishing its first board. The goal, as set with the Maritime Commission, was to deliver 25 Liberty ships by March of 1943. A construction site was chosen three miles out from the city on the east bank of the Cape Fear River. Construction of slipways and workshops on the 57-acre plot began in February of 1941. On May the 22nd, the keels of two Liberty ships were laid down at the yards, with the production guided by officers of the Newport News Company who came down to instruct the locals in the intricacies of shipbuilding. While these and the other first four ships were being built, the shipyard was ordered, expanded by the Maritime Commission, and another 24 acres of land were converted for the site. The first ship would be christened and launched in December, which was a very exciting moment. On December the 6th, 1941, the SS Zebulon B. Vance slid into the Cape Fear River. The next day, America was at war. Through the expansion of the shipyard, construction would cost $20.3 million, consume 162 acres of marshland. Nine slipways were built with 67 cranes, three piers, a thousand feet of mooring bulkheads, and 24 miles of newly paved roads and railways. They developed the motto, quote, to build good ships quickly, and would build 243 Victory, Liberty, and other cargo ships. Wilmington was booming, with thousands of new yard workers from all around the state pumping into dorms, restaurants, bars, stores, and movies. About a quarter of them lived more than 25 miles away and would have to commute every day or only move back for the weekends. For them and other workers, improvements were made by the building of three neighborhoods of temporary homes and dormitories. While these were dwarfed in scale by the Kaiser Company's equivalents on the Pacific coast, the boom Wilmington saw was clear to everyone. The yard would ultimately close in 1946 with all but 28 of their ships still afloat. We've talked before in multiple videos about the point of America's decentralized naval reserve fleets across the Atlantic and Pacific coasts, but a refresher might be necessary for those who haven't seen those videos. The consensus after World War II was that in both of the great wars up to now, America had been caught flat-footed. Well, the Navy itself was admirable in most terms of strength, the Merchant Marine was unprepared for the tolls of both wars. 
To prevent a third repeat of that mistake, a large majority of Liberty, Victory, and Ocean-class cargo ships with other necessary vessels were set aside in harbors and river basins all across the country. The Wilmington Reserve Fleet was established in 1946, around the same time the yard closed, and within months, 648 ships were tied up ship to ship on both sides of the Brunswick River. Rust preventative paint was applied to the ship hulls, and as much of the old oils and lubricants were removed as possible. And so it was. The ships would stay here for over 20 years. We're going to cover these ships in depth, but if you'd like to get better acquainted with the great vessels throughout history, you should check out War Thunder, the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. My favorite feature is their massive collection of vehicles spanning over 100 years, from the 1920s to the modern day. This is the perfect game for history lovers, since every vehicle is accurately detailed all the way down to their individual components. There are over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships to choose from in what will be a dynamic experience of combined arms and PvP battles. So if you like to immerse yourself in history with incredible 4K graphics and dynamic vehicle damage mode, I've got you covered. You can play free now on PC, Xbox Series X and S, PlayStation 5, or the previous console generations by clicking the link in the description below. New War Thunder players across all platforms, as well as those who haven't played in the past six months, can claim a large bonus pack, including multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, an exclusive 3D decorator for vehicles, and much more by using our link in the description. So click that link to play now, no ifs, no maybes. Thank you to War Thunder for sponsoring this video, and now, back to our story. The first ship of note is the Liberty ship Samuel Parker. The Parker, a rather unremarkable ship from the outside, has a short but respectable history. Built by the Oregon Shipbuilding Corporation, Parker joined the Merchant Marines under the charter with the American Mail Line. She arrived with a convoy in the Mediterranean in 1943 and came under British command to shuttle men and supplies across North Africa in preparation for the invasion of Sicily. Her story nearly came to a head on March the 19th while she was moored in Tripoli. A crashing bomber lost control over the Allied fleet and entered one final dive. In its death throes, the bomber quite nearly crashed into the Parker's mast. Instead, it crashed dead on with the ship directly next to her, the Ocean Voyager. Voyager, a munitions carrier, erupted in flames immediately. Five of Parker's crewmen took a motor cutter and saved six British sailors from the burning Voyager. On another occasion, during the invasion, while unloading aviation fuel and munitions dangerously close to the front line, Parker came under fire from German incendiary bullets. The volatile cargo was set on fire and had to be rapidly put out by sailors descending into the cargo holds with cargo hoses. An inspection revealed almost 150 bullet holes in the side of the ship. The Samuel Parker was transferred to the Wilmington Reserve after 1947, staying in the reserve fleet until she was scrapped in 1969. Our next story is about three ships built by the North Carolina Shipbuilding Company during the war. The SS William Moultrie, Nathaniel Green, and Virginia Dare would transit from Wilmington to Scotland, where they embarked supplies for the Soviet Union and met their escort group and fellow freighters of convoy PQ-18. The 40 merchant ships left Scotland on September the 2nd. Reminded of their previous disastrous convoy to the USSR, PQ-17, this convoy came under heavy escort with four destroyers and anti-aircraft ships in close support, plus 16 more destroyers in search of destroyed positions across the convoy. Additional support included two British battleships and three heavy cruisers. Sailing through the Arctic Circle was treacherous during World War II because it was close to occupied Norway where there was nowhere to hide from German bomber aircraft and a rife U-boat presence. And on September the 7th, Virginia became one of the first ships to come under attack. A German torpedo bomber had found the convoy and lined up for a run on the ship. The naval armed guards would manage to shoot this first plane down, plus two more the next day. More waves of German aircraft would attack the convoy, attempting to scatter or sink it. 
And from these attacks, Virginia Dare's Naval Guard shot down four more planes before arriving safely to unload supplies. Moultrie would have no easier time of it. While almost the target of German air attacks, she shot down three bombers on September the 13th and damaged six more, possibly assisting other ships in destroying their would-be attackers. The next day, they would have more luck and be reminded just how dangerous this mission was. PQ-18 was attacked by torpedoes and horizontal bombers. Moultrie would destroy four more throughout the day, but watched as a ship in the center of the convoy was hit head on. The Mary Looking Back, an ordnance ship in the most heavily protected part of the fleet, took a direct hit and was vaporized by the cargo of dynamite. The crew of the Moultrie felt themselves knocked off their feet by the concussion, but would get back up and continue to defend their ship. The Nathaniel Green was also right there when disaster struck, seeing the ship suddenly disappear in flames and feeling their ship wrenching and screaming from the concussion made some members of the crew believe that they had been hit as well. By the time the smoke cleared, they realized that they were afloat, but not intact. Their cargo was mostly destroyed, the compass was out of adjustment, portholes and bulkheads were shattered and dented, leaving them no other option than to proceed with their fellows to the USSR. The Naval Armed Guard reported shooting eight German planes down in their defense. Now, as a caveat, given how tight this convoy's formation was and the nature of witness testimony, it is possible that the number of damaged or destroyed bombers is lower or that these ships shared credit for the bombers brought down or damaged by their guns. It's hard to tell from old reports how much is completely accurate, but whatever the case, the Virginia Dare and the Green would be grounded after torpedo attacks in the Mediterranean the next year, and then be scrapped shortly after the war. Maltry would be kept in the James River Reserve until being scrapped in 1970. The next notable ship in the Wilmington Flotilla is the Boulder Victory. Built in the Richmond, California yards, the Boulder Victory was the lead ship of a Victory subclass specialized for ammunition ferrying. After construction in October of 1944, she served in the Pacific to run ammunition to the many island hopping operations aimed towards Japan and the Philippines. Unlike the Atlantic supply routes, the Pacific ones were safer, at least marginally, because Japanese submariners targeted American warships rather than logistics. Still, the presence of Japanese seaplanes, island air bases, and floating mines posed a danger to everyone. Boulder Victory would see that firsthand on December the 20th. With her cargo hulls fully loaded with heavy ordnance, the mine contacted and blew up hold number two. Whether by luck or something greater, the ammunition fires that were or would have been caused by the explosion were put out by rushing seawater. Two more explosions were felt in the ship but put out, and Boulder Victory would surprisingly limp back low in the water with a damaged engine room but with no crew deaths. Still, the damage put her war service to a close. Boulder was in a floating dry dock for repairs when the Japanese Empire surrendered. After the repairs made her seaworthy, she would run missions between Hawaii and Okinawa to ferry home returning American soldiers as well as provide supplies for the occupation forces. She entered the Wilmington Reserve Fleet briefly right after its founding, but was sold back to the American Hawaiian Steamship Company to serve for a few more years until ultimately retiring in the larger Susum Bay Reserve Flotilla. She remained there until 1984 when she was finally sold for scrap. Our next ships were the converted Liberty ships such as the Edward Burton, James Harnell, William Riddle, and James Wheeler. All of these ships were later War Liberty ships, mostly built and launched by the J.A. Jones Yard in Panama, Florida in 1945. They missed any convoy mission in the Atlantic or Pacific by the time they were ready. Still, after the war, they ran cargo between America and Europe for the post-war reconstruction. In 1948, they were placed in the Wilmington Flotilla until being ordered back to service by the Navy in 1955. Following a design conversion in the Charleston Naval Station 
each was renamed and equipped with the latest long-range radar and communication equipment. This conversion made one of the practical but effective Guardian-class picket ships, a subclass of Liberty ships retained by the fleet and upgraded for long-range reconnaissance. This was one of America's many efforts to establish and maintain our distant early warning line during the Cold War. Ships like the renamed Interceptor, Picket, Tracer, and Searcher formed sea-based radar warning stations that would patrol the North Atlantic to watch and monitor incoming Soviet aircraft, warships, and later missiles. Interception had a long but probably boring career as a radar picket until finally being retired and moved to Susan Bay Reserve in 1968, only to ultimately be scrapped in the 1970s. Next and finally is the USS Southampton, a specialized attack cargo ship for transporting marines and landing vessels in the Pacific Theater. Built in Wilmington and commissioned in September of 1944, she set sail for the island hopping campaign during November and participated in some of the last full-scale battles of the war. The ship and its Marine Corps complement would practice amphibious landings for two months in Hawaii, plus more rehearsals in the Marshall Islands to prepare for the invasion of Iwo Jima. She was one of the 495 ships surrounding the island, protected by Admiral Mark Mitcher's massively fatal Task Force 58 carrier group and heavy air cover from the Army Air Corps on other captured islands. On the coast of the heavily fortified island, Southampton set to work, unloading its Higgin boats and amphibious tractors even as bombardment from both sides continued. At one point, Japanese mortars aimed at the ship but only injured two sailors. For the rest of February, the ship's boats would ferry supplies to the marines and evacuate wounded men harassed by the Japanese kamikazes. But even when the seas themselves turned against the ship and the American flotilla, she and other vessels of the auxiliary supply fleet did not falter. Some crew on the Southampton even recorded witnessing the Marines and Army raising the Star-Spangled Banner on the crest of Mount Suribachi. After Iwo Jima, the crew had little chance to rest as they sailed to Tinian to load Marines and combat equipment from the Marine 2nd Division and rehearsed landings in the Marshals. Their next mission began in April of 1945. While fainting for landing on the 1st, one of her fellow attack ships the Hinsdale was mortally hit by a kamikaze, and the Southampton's boats took to rescuing the crew and redeploying the Marines and cargo still aboard the other ships. Another feint was repeated the next day before the fleet ultimately returned to safer pastures after passing through mine-infested waters. Southampton embarked soldiers from the 81st Army and would sail to Japan for the first time to land occupation forces. She stayed in the occupation force until November of 1945, before sailing home and being decommissioned at the Norfolk Naval Yards in 1946. She was sold for commercial shipping and would run in civilian service until 1971, when she was sailed to Taiwan and sold for scrap. The Wilmington Reserve Fleet and North Carolina Shipbuilding Company are now both only shadows of the past. The shipbuilding company would close immediately after the war, and the reserve fleet would never be reactivated at the scale of others we've already covered, such as the Hudson Reserve. Despite its size and significance as a southern-based auxiliary fleet near multiple vulnerable naval stations and deep-water harbors, it would be retired in the 60s and the final ship towed away for scrap or relocated by the end of 1968. However, at their peak, they were magnificent sights and an excellent reflection of what builders and workers across America accomplished in only a few years. I bet many of the former yard workers would see them when they were out on the river or nearby the roads. And I'm also sure, even with the ships partly rusting or ignored by the Navy, they were proud of what they achieved. A notion which I suppose brings us full circle. So thanks again to War Thunder for supporting the channel. Make sure to click our link in the description to play now and claim your large free bonus pack. So I thank you all for watching. And until next time, this is Ryan Sokash signing off.